In uh, today's Big Bang, I shall be making the strangest jigsaw you ever saw. That's a pair of chickens. I'm going to show you how to make these wacky 3D specs. And I shall be discovering the strange but true story of the pendulum. But first, a trick. Kate, I'd like you to meet Mr Potato Head. Mr Potato Head, Kate Bellingham. Hello. Now, this trick requires you to knock Mr Potato Head over by swinging this potato. Well, that's easy enough. Ah, 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 ah. You can't touch that potato or that string. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, that's not going to reach, is it? All right, I'll show you how it's done. You see, a swinging potato is a pendulum. And a pendulum is a very odd thing. Watch what happens. The first potato starts swinging, twisting the string at the top. And that twist transfers the energy of that first pendulum to the second pendulum over here. And it should, in theory, <coughs> knock Mr Potato Head over. Now, eventually, the first potato would stop swinging and this one would absorb all that energy and carry on swinging. Now, that's a clever trick, but what's odd about it? Well, did you notice that the potato in the middle didn't start swinging. Because a pendulum will only start a second pendulum swinging if the second pendulum is the same length as the first or a ninth of that length. Now, that is odd. But I'm going to out-odd you with a simple but weird trick with just a piece of paper. And I'll show you that oddness at the end of the programme. They're definitely pencils, Kate. I know they are, Gareth, but I was just looking at how different the world looks through different eyes. You're kidding me. The world looks different through your left eye than your right eye. It does. Show your right eye and point at something on the other side of the room. All right, I'm pointing at the lava rocket over there. Now, keep your hand in the same place, open your right eye and shut your left eye. Where are you pointing now? Now I'm pointing at the flowers. And I didn't move my arm. Ah, it's very odd. The reason is because you've got a gap between your eyes, so your left eye looks at the world at a different angle to your right eye. It's called stereo vision, and it means that you can work out how far away things are. Yeah, but I can still work out how far away things are with one eye closed. Look, I still know that this pencil is nearer than this pencil. But that's only because you know how big the pencils are. You know they're the same size. Have a look in that box. Look through the hole with just one eye and tell me what you see. Well, I can see a room with a window and a door and a square pattern on the floor and a huge Kate Bellingham and a little tiny Gareth Jones. Open the front up and see what's really inside. Oh, that's odd. They're exactly the same height. The room's a funny shape, but because you were only looking with one eye, you couldn't tell that the wall behind me was closer to us than the wall behind you, and that made you think that the figures were different sizes. So you can only see in 3D when you use both eyes? Exactly. But it's the brain that does the really clever bit. It merges together the images it gets from the two eyes, and they pop into wonderful 3D. Go on, then prove it. I can. Now, I'm going to take a photo of you, so I want you to pose and sit absolutely still. OK. Well, coming completely and... natural. <laughs> Brilliant. 
Lovely. Thank you very much, Gareth. It's all right. You, you can stop now. <laughs> you see, what I've done is I've taken two photos a couple of centimetres apart and I get slightly different views of the world like I do through my eyes. To see those photos in 3D, what you need are 3D specs. Basically, it's just a piece of card with two eye holes cut in, a magnifying glasses stuck on, and I've started making one for you. There you are. It's a piece of card that will cover the top of your face, uh -huh. and I've cut a, a big bit out for your nose at the bottom. I've only got a little nose. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I have to make sure that the eye holes are the same distance apart as your eyes, because it's important that they are. Now, uh -huh. let, yeah, let me just check that against there. Yep, those will do. Good. So all you have to do now is stick on your magnifying glasses. OK, what, right. like uh, this in the centre? No, uh, no, you want them, you want it to look cross-eyed. Pull them apart a bit. So more like that, yeah? That's right, yeah. Okay. yeah. And you can stick them on with sticky tape. Right. OK, now, these are the two pictures. There we go. Um, put the stereoscope up to your eye. That's what it's called. You all right? And wow. hold, hold that, I'll put it in your hand for you. Hold <laughs> that a distance away and gradually bring it nearer. Till it's in focus, yeah? And the two pictures should merge into one and jump into 3D. Oh, that's incredible. That really is 3D. Here, yeah, have a look. Uh, Gareth, no, it's not going to work. You see, telly's only in 2D, so they won't be able Sorry. to see it. But it is excellent. It's brilliant, isn't it? Yes, it is brilliant. <laughs>when he noticed a swinging light. In those days, churches were where you went to meet up with your friends. So maybe Galileo was hanging out with his mates in the church and he got a bit bored. So maybe it was him who started the light swinging. Well, whatever, it was the swinging light which started Galileo thinking. Now, there aren't too many questions that you can ask about a swinging light, but the most obvious one has the most interesting answer. Galileo wanted to know how long it took the light to swing from one side to the other and back again. So he decided to time it. And to do this, he kept time with his pulse. So, for the first time ever, Galileo timed the period of a pendulum, the time it took for the lamp to complete one swing. What Galileo had discovered was that the time it takes for a pendulum to swing from one side to the other and back again is always about the same. And if you set up that pendulum very carefully, that time does not change at all, whether the pendulum is swinging a few centimetres or whether it's swinging several metres. It wasn't until he was an old man that Galileo had the idea of attaching his pendulum to a set of gears and springs to build a machine which could show the time. He never actually got round to building the machine himself, but because he was such a great thinker, when it was finally constructed, everything worked. Like clockwork. Time to move on. 300 years after Galileo, there lived a Frenchman called Jean-Bernard Léon Foucault. He installed a 67-metre pendulum in a church in Paris. We've got a pendulum here that reaches all the way from the ceiling to this red weight near the floor. Foucault wanted a long pendulum because long pendulums are difficult to disturb. Unless something actually touches them, they'll continue swinging along the same line. So Foucault marked that line on the floor. He did this because he believed this experiment would prove that the Earth was turning. And this is how he did it. He tied off the pendulum with very fine thread and let it settle for a few hours. Then, to set it swinging, he burnt through that thread so as not to disturb it with his trembling hands. Because it was such a long pendulum, it kept swinging for several hours. And as time passed, something very strange happened. The pendulum seemed to change its path. 
and swing along a different line. But Foucault knew this was impossible. Nothing was touching the pendulum, and it was free to swing along the same path. So how could it be moving around? Foucault knew that there could only be one possible explanation. It wasn't the pendulum that was changing its direction of swing. It was the church that was turning. Foucault had proved that the Earth was rotating. The pendulum was free to swing along its line, but the church had its foundations in the soil, and it was the church that was turning. Foucault had clearly shown that the Earth moved, and in his honour, this pendulum is now called Foucault's Pendulum. Gareth's not finished his puzzle. Hi, honey, I'm home. Hi, I'm just doing your puzzle. It's really pretty. Ah, uh, it's more than a puzzle. It's a game. The idea is to put these shapes together and completely cover the table without leaving any gaps. I've started there using triangles and rows of squares, but you could put them together like this. I've got... Uh, those stars. Yeah, sort of a square with triangles on the end. Then put those stars together and that would completely cover the table without leaving any gaps. But um, there are thousands of shapes which don't actually work. How do you know which ones do then? Well, it's a matter of trial and error, really, trying out. Um, these are fairly regular, the squares and the triangles, but try these. What are they? Pentagons, five sides ah, to them. Ah, OK. Well, Kate's looking at those. Come and have a look at these. Now, these are a similar sort of game, but this time the shapes are slightly more irregular. Some of the sides are the same length, but some aren't. Now, I could put these together in a nice, sensible row like that, and that would cover the whole area here, but really, that's a bit boring. What you want to do is put them together in a more irregular way, like this. Eventually, they will fit, and they should completely cover this area. Have a look at this. This is uh, some tiling that I did earlier. They seem to form regular patterns. But look again, and you realise that the pattern never actually repeats, and it absolutely will cover this area. And this type of non-repeating pattern is called Penrose tiling, named after the man who discovered it. Gareth, I've discovered something. What's that? Pentagons are rubbish. They don't work at all. Mm, all right, well, if you didn't get on well with those, have a go with these. Chickens? Well, they might be plastic chickens to you, but to me, they're Penrose chickens. It's exactly the same game. These birds will actually fit together and cover the whole area. Oh, it's really good, Gareth, but don't you think my pattern's a bit poultry? Kate, that was a foul pun. <sighs> Before we go, time for me to impress you with my piece of paper. Right, I've put a half turn in it and stuck the ends together. What do you think you'll get if you cut down the middle? Come I on, think it. I will get two strips with a half turn down the middle. Mm, right, what we'll are you keep doing? cutting. I'm doing, I'm cutting round a third in from the edge. I have to go all the way round twice, so I have to, whoops, cut twice as far. It's not very straight, this. What have you got then? I've got one loop twice the size with a complete turn in it. Oh. What have you got? Uh, I've got two <laughs> loops, different sizes, that are linked together. Well, and all because of that half turn. Fantastic. I've been outweirded by a piece of paper. That's it for this Big Bang. When we return, we're going to be taking a close-up look at just about everything. See you then. <laughs> <laughs>